Well, the, the league just plays an incredibly powerful role uh, when it comes to the making of public policy and, and understanding that we've got to come together uh, from uh, from both the state level and the federal level to think about how we help people in our communities. The league is grounded in our communities. Uh, the people who work for the, for the league understand the communities uh, intimately, uh, as uh, Gilda Jacobs did. That's why she was just an amazing an amazing uh, advocate uh, for, for people in the community. The League is an incredibly trusted resource and um, reference point for legislators and decision makers in Michigan. Um, they are an organization that produces really comprehensive, in-depth, um, uh, useful tools, not just for legislators, but for advocates and community-based organizations across the state. There is um, an intensive effort to really understand what's going on for people, the goals and aspirations of people, and that drives the policy work of the League and the agenda setting for the League. And to me, that is incredibly valuable. They've been in existence for a hundred years uh, plus, but that their work unfortunately still needs to be as strong as it was then now, because we still have these things that are, um, are, are really um, sad, difficult, challenging things that many communities are facing. But the Michigan League for Public Policy is here to stay. And they're uh, so important in making sure that people get a chance to get all the things that they deserve and have a quality of life that every human being deserves. Good afternoon and welcome to the Michigan League for Public Policy's 2022 Forum. I'm Charlie Ballard. I'm the chair of the League's Board of Directors, and I'm so pleased that you're able to be with us here today for today's program. This year, the League celebrated its 110th anniversary. That's a pretty remarkable accomplishment. The League has stood strong through over a century of change, and we've been able to do that because our organization is committed to the values that make us strong. Dignity and belonging for all, social and economic justice, a strong democratic process, integrity and nonpartisanship, equity, diversity, and inclusion, fairness and opportunity. Above all, the League values the people of Michigan, all the people of Michigan. We're all here today because we understand that people should be at the center of policy work. And until we see full economic, and racial justice for all Michiganders, we cannot fulfill our true potential as a state. That's what Just In Time is all about. We're here at a critical moment in history. We're seeing increased voter engagement thanks to initiatives like Promote the Vote. We're seeing opportunities to invest in solutions that pe put people first. We're seeing a broad commitment to justice but we must not stop at what we see. Now is the time to act. Today's program will provide a clear view of the current policy landscape, but we'll also get a bold vision for what the future could be if we work together. Our keynote speaker, Taifa Butler, will share a framework for an equitable economy, and our panel discussion will show us how we can open doors to health and well being by improving access to safe and affordable housing. I'm honored to serve the League, the Michigan League for Public Policy and to be part of today's important discussion. Kicking things off will be our acting president and CEO, Karen Holcomb Merrill. Karen has been with the League since 2009 and she usually serves as our chief op operating officer. Because our president and CEO, Monique Stanton, is away on parental leave, Karen has stepped up to take the helm on a temporary basis. This means she's not only doing two jobs, but she also has the joy of taking on public speaking engagements like 
this one. So please join me in welcoming Karen. Thank you so much, Charlie, for that warm introduction. Our new president and CEO, Monique Stanton, has been instrumental in directing the league as we continue the tradition of serving Michigan's families, children, workers, and communities. And I'm proud to be serving on her behalf for a few more weeks. Since our last forum, the league has been able to celebrate many wins for Michiganders, including expansion of the Healthy Moms, Healthy Babies Initiative, which will provide Medicaid coverage for 12 months postpartum, expand home visiting, and increase access to behavioral health care. A major investment in K-12 education, including effectively closing the gap in the per pupil payment and funding for schools to hire psychologists, social workers, counselors, and nurses. Funding for the Lead Poisoning Prevention Fund, which helps landlords and homeowners to safely remove lead from their properties. And funding for several initiatives to address the drastic racial and economic health disparities that were magnified by the COVID-19 crisis. For decades, the League and advocacy partners have fought to improve Michigan's childcare system and we celebrated some major advancements, including grants for childcare providers, funding to help parents in need of high quality, affordable childcare, bonuses for childcare workers who are among the state's lowest paid workers, and improvements to the childcare subsidy system, including a rate increase for providers. This work could not have happened without your support and the support of our partners around the state. But I do want to take a moment to recognize the efforts and dedication of the League's senior policy analyst, Pat Sorensen, who devoted decades to improving the child care system and who was able to celebrate these wins with us before she retired in 2021. The League continues to work hard to advocate for policy needs at the state and federal level to address the needs of over 1 million Michigan households who struggle to make ends meet. There is broad bipartisan support for expansion of the earned income tax credit here in Michigan. And there is clear evidence that COVID era policies like the expanded child tax credit improvements to housing access, and strengthened health care coverage have lifted millions of Americans out of poverty. Today's forum will focus on the importance of securing economic justice and creating bold new policies that resolve problems that have been around far longer than the pandemic, problems that are rooted in a system built on racism, in a history of wealth inequity, that continues to grow more stark and in a country where voting rights continue to be suppressed. Our keynote speaker, Taifa Butler, is here today to show us that these problems can be solved if we commit ourselves to the hard work ahead. Now, before I introduce Taifa, I have a few housekeeping notes for you. An agenda can be found in the comments section of today's live stream. Taifa and our panelists will be answering audience questions. You can submit your questions in two ways. You may email questions to info at mlpp.org, or you may text ask MLPP, all one word, to 63566. Our team will be on hand behind the scenes to field questions, and we will attempt to answer as many as possible time permitting. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't thank our sponsors and donors for making today's event possible. We are grateful to the many corporations, foundations, and individuals for their commitment to our work, including our guardian sponsors, the Max M. and Marjorie S. Fisher Foundation, Rock Ventures, and Jennifer R. Poteet. 
We are also very grateful to all of the individuals who contributed to the lead through the registration process. And now, finally, I'm excited to be able to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Taifa Smith Butler. Taifa is president of Demos, an organization that champions solutions that will create a democracy and economy rooted in racial equity. She came to Demos after nearly a decade at the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute, where she led and inspired the team as its president and CEO. She is an established leader known as a problem solver and tireless champion for equity. Taifa brings more than 25 years of experience in strategic communication, public policy research, and data analysis in the public, nonprofit, and private sectors. And we are honored that she is here with us today to share her wisdom and expertise. I am especially pleased to be able to, do, to introduce Taifa, who is a friend and is someone I was able to work with and learn from in the State Priorities Partnership Network. Taifa, welcome. Thank you so much, Karen. It's been a pleasure to be a partner with you all these years and with the Michigan League of Public Policy. And I appreciate this opportunity to be with you all today, uh, just in time. Um, so as I get started, I, I wanna just recognize that we all bring a different story to this work. We all bring a different lived experience. And one of the things that I used to joke about in terms of my own experience was early in my career, I would joke with my team about how uh, I dreamed of being an actress on TV. And I'd say, you know, doing this work of public policy was just my side hustle until I got my big break and got discovered. But as it turns out, uh, working to save democracy is the drama of the day. Uh, and it's sort of an epic story Hollywood screenwriters uh, could really dream of. Um, and I see protagonists and I see antagonists all over the place uh, in terms of this work. And I know uh, in the room, the Zoom room, the stream yard room today, there are a host of my fellow protagonists and Demos and I are glad to be in this fight with all of you, um, in this fight for equity and justice and power for the people of this country. So again, thank you. And which brings me to this point today um, that we're here to talk about one of the central forces uh, that is unfolding in our collective story in uh, the United States is our economy. Um, some like to describe it as an inevitable, invisible force, but as you know, and I know, um, that that is not the case. Our economy is a product of actors and choices. And the economy is not something that happens just to us. Uh, it is us. We shape it and experience it every single day in the choices that we make and in the stark decisions that we face. Uh, the American economy produces abundance. We know that. According to many measures, the U.S. the U.S. is the wealthiest nation in the world. And yet we lack the mechanisms to ensure that this plenty is shared. And year after year, policymakers and corporate behemoths work to extract wealth from the majority of us and concentrate it in the hands of a tiny but mighty minority. Which brings me to my second most striking characteristic of our economy is that it creates winners and losers based on human hierarchies defined by race and class and gender and disability status and geography. Equity has never been a value embraced by those who write the rules of our democracy and economy. Instead, it has valued from day one the colonizer, the landowner, or the land thief. It has valued the slave owner, the white skin, the able body, the homeowner, the employer, uh, the corporate lobbyist, and the campaign donor. We've seen that. And so our, the value construct in our economy is echoed also precisely in our democracy. 
And that's because as Demos has often talked about, economic power and political power are inextricably linked. Our economy and our democracy are one. And we'd be remiss to think about that, that they're separate. And so until we change the value construct in our economy, uh, we will continue to perpetuate the oppression and the exploitation of those who have been most marginalized and excluded. And in order to have the justice, the economic justice that we want and that we need, we must build power. And at Demos, we keep our fingers on the pulse of movement. Our, our movement partners tell us to build, to build this multiracial, inclusive democracy. Uh, there has to be a power shift. And we must expand across the ballot and opportunities for people of color to actually run for office and win, right? We've, we've got to begin this important work of building power um, and the work that I know the Michigan League is helping to lead through the Promote the Vote Coalition. But it's also an economic imperative for us. We want to see black and brown people, people who make low wages, people who have struggled to make ends meet, uh, have the power and influence in the economic forces that affect their lives each and every day. And to contest for public control over public goods. How do we engage with these mega corporations that come into our communities and try to turn them into profit centers? To co-govern so that people can sit at the decision-making table um, and build power is what we need. And we want to see this 365 days, 24-7, not just in an election season. Our history of underinvesting in our communities of color is not our destiny. You and I are here every day fighting against that. In fact, our destiny is that 20 years from now, the U.S. will become a nation whose population is a majority people of color. And if we don't find a way to fundamentally shift power before that happens, we risk perpetuating the inequity that characterizes our economy and our democracy. We must address these structural issues with structural solutions head on at all levels of government and policymaking, state, local, federal. And at the federal level, it's encouraging to see the Biden administration working to advance some of these solutions. We can appreciate the administration's efforts uh, while still acknowledging right, that recent federal policy advances come as a result of tireless organizing and advocacy in black and brown communities and by our labor partners, uh, not to mention voting in overwhelming uh, numbers despite the barriers uh, some policymakers continually uh, specifically uh, advance to stop us. And one example of this is the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, this legislation contains provisions that pro protagonists uh, in the story of justice have long fought for. Uh, investments in renewable energy, uh, climate investments aimed at poor and communities of color, pushing corporations uh, to pay their fair share, and all of this is cause for celebration. Yet, the Inflation Reduction Act also creates winners and losers. How could it not, right? It, it was achieved through the same tired process of a few powerful white men negotiating a deal that sacrifices the needs of some people for the benefit of others. And so some of the things that we traded away were critically needed investments in our infrastructure, uh, in affordable housing, in childcare, in healthcare, and the child tax credit and the EITC, two powerful and proven tools for economic justice. We've got to continue to fight for those. And all of these uh, priorities for the Michigan League and for our communities, we know that you all are in the fight and that these were elements included in the equity focused Build Back Better proposal. But during negotiations, Build Back Better got whittled down into the Inflation Reduction Act. And, and people whose needs were most easily traded away were, you guessed it, people of color and women. 
And those of us here today know that the future we want requires us to flip the order of operations uh, in our economy. If it's why one of the frameworks we really appreciate, the Black Women Best Framework, uh, turned by uh, economist Janelle Jones, is one of the exciting frames to really reimagine our economy. Black women have been among the most marginalized, and yet we continually see them as leaders in expanding access and rights for all of our communities. We need policies designed for us and by us that bring us into the economic mainstream um, because policies that elevate Black women will ultimately benefit everyone. And it's no secret uh, who the antagonists are in this story of justice. Uh, it's the corporate oligarchs and the politicians who are beholding to them um, doing their bidding. And the lopsided distrib distribution of wealth and power uh, that they've created is absolutely breathtaking. Uh, the top 1% have more wealth than the entire middle class. During the pandemic, billionaires have seen their wealth increase by 58% while the rest of us have suffered, particularly communities of color. Amazon, for example, saw their profits in 2020 increase almost $6 billion above their, 20, their 2019 profits, yet almost none of it went to its workers. There's no surprise that we see this labor movement among Amazon workers, and I'm here for it. Uh, the billionaire class is using every lever at their disposal to continue, continue funneling wealth and decision-making power to themselves. And one of the biggest levers is our political system. The oligarchs bathing in pandemic profits are some of the same people who finance lobbying campaigns that derailed Build Back Better. The same people who fuel voter suppression laws in states across the country who finance gerrymandering to reduce Black voting power as happened here in Michigan? Who fund the politicians and the media outlets that spread the big lie and undermine faith in the function and the very notion of our democracy? But remember, our economy and our democracy are one. The corporations that fuel inequity and the politicians that suppress democratic participation are part of the same continuum, the snake eating its own tail. Are authoritarian politicians setting favorable conditions for the wealthy in exchange for being funded to amass political power for themselves? Yes. Are the oligarchs putting unprincipled politicians in power to protect corporate interests? Yes. It's a symbiotic bromance. Wealthy oligarch seeks authoritarian politician for walking on the beach and undermining democracy together. <laughs> but those are the villains um, in our story of justice. And I'm excited to know that there are protagonists that show up each and every day. Everyone, like I said, in this room and communities uh, we are a part of and fight for. The grassroots leaders and the organizers the community advocates, the people who champion equity from within nonprofits and the public sector. These protagonists are the kinds of grassroots organizations that Demos featured in our recent case studies, like Pittsburgh United, who built an advocacy of Flint Rising to stop Pittsburgh from handing over its public water system to Aveolia, the same corporation that destroyed Flint's water. And like the coalition for us, not Amazon, that organized to prevent the corporate giant uh, from taking over the civic and political life in Northern Virginia, where Amazon is building its second headquarters. These are two organizations we featured in our case studies. All of us protagonists working together have an opportunity to ensure uh, power moves out of plush conference rooms and into the hands of the demos, the people, the workers, black and brown communities where it belongs. And demos and others call for this rightful balance of power, economic democracy, 
to achieve economic democracy, we must do three things. Break up and regulate new corporate powers like Amazon and Google and Meta. We've got to ensure that the essentials like childcare and housing and internet access are recognized as public goods and they are equitably administered. And finally, we've got to demand co-governance that provides an equal voice for the public in making decisions about the economy. And I love uh, the work of Dr. Ibram Kendi and how to be an anti-racist. And one of the things he said to us years ago was that uh, to do the work of anti-racism, there is no sideline to this struggle. It means that we all in our respective roles and responsibilities have to engage. It is a national struggle and the states are the battleground. It's the states like Michigan that show us what is possible. As some of you know, I spent a good deal of my career doing policy work in Georgia, as Karen mentioned, and we looked up to you all here in Michigan with awe um, at the work that you all were doing each and every day. I'm inspired by the work of the Michigan League for Public Policy. The sheer breadth of tax and budget and policy issues you take on, and not one of them is optional. We must do them all. And they are essential to an inclusive democracy that we are trying to build. And the owner's manual uh, for Michigan that you all published a few years ago is a brilliant resource and foundation. Uh, its namesake makes me smile. Um, your annual participation in the Kids Count uh, project is a rigor as rigorous and relevant as ever. Um, and I'm in awe of the fact that Michigan, like states in Georgia, New Mexico, and North Carolina, Organizations and voters are showing tremendous resilience and stamina to organize through suppression, intimidation, and subversive tactics. You know, Demos has a strong history of working with Michigan. Uh, in 2014, we analyzed the choice bankruptcy uh, filing and uncovered hundreds of millions of dollars in unfair financial fees that the city would have been forced to pay. And most recently, we partnered with the Black Futures Lab and four Michigan groups, among others, uh, to produce the Black Census Report, the largest survey of Black people conducted in the U.S. since Reconstruction. We published an analysis of how reducing student debt in Michigan should shrink or would shrink the racial wealth gap. And we are proud in our ongoing partnership with Mothering Justice and other state-based groups in our Inclusive Democracy Project to combat racist gerrymandering and voter ID laws. But it's the future um, that I'm most interested in, in particular as the new president of Demos, 16 months on the job. The importance of state-based research, policy, and organizing cannot be overestimated. I wanna to talk uh, to some lessons learned uh, in emerging uh, from state policy work across the country. First, we've learned uh, that a comprehensive strategy to building grassroots power is essential. We know that. Um, policy think tanks like us, like Michigan League, um, must connect to movement and be informed by the field. Our strategies need to resonate with folks on the ground, even as they move policymakers and opinion makers. Second, we have to strengthen the field and broaden advocacy efforts. We can't fight for the crumbs. Michigan League knows this well, especially as we do tax and budget work. You've got to ensure that there is appropriate and equitable investments in the services and the infrastructure that we care most about. And we have to work together to educate each other about what's possible. And third, even in blue and purple states, uh, we need to continue to hold policymakers to account on an ongoing basis. Sometimes politicians get a little too comfortable uh, being in these seats, and so we have to hold them accountable. And finally, and always, as you all know, we must center racial equity. Um, let's take risks, let's be bold, and let's be fearless. And of course, we are the protagonists, so we have the upside of the story. I know I can't leave here either and close my remarks without talking about philanthropy. I'm sure there may be some uh, in the room. 
donors and funders are making vital investments uh, in swing states and movement states. And these dollars are making a big difference. But I hear a lot of frustration, particularly from our movement partners on the ground, saying that every state is facing battles. And we have to, and we need our philanthropic allies to see all of us, not just the special states, not just the low hanging fruit, but this is a pivotal moment in our nation and every state needs investment. And I know the resources are vast. Um, we become uh, in this scarcity mindset when we think that there is not enough. I um, mean, we know that there is. The work of defending our democracy um, and promoting equity doesn't just occur in even numbered years, right? It takes place every day and we must trust and fund the foundational work that allows organizers to reach as many people as possible, build community relationships as much as possible. And that work may not bear fruit for years, but is an, it is an important element that we cannot forsake, especially outside of election cycles. So I wanna encourage you all today to let's keep equity as our guiding light uh, and invest fiercely in the demos, which is the people. We can produce higher levels of growth by reimagining the safety net and advancing policies that bene benefit people who most need it. We can protect our democracy from the nearest polling place to the nation's capital. We can expand our definition of democracy beyond voting and policymaking to include building civic power and ways for regular folk to participate in the decisions about the economy. And the way forward is to amplify these solutions that are advanced by and build power for black and brown folks who have been historically excluded. We have to target our interventions on them. That way all of us will benefit. That is the clearest way that we can in ensure an inclusive multiracial democracy um, in which all of us can fully participate and thrive. And I love this quote from James Baldwin, we must do what we can do and fortify and save each other. So let's do just that, fortify each other, save each other and save our democracy and our economy while we're at it. Our future, my friends, is calling. Let's go build it. Thank you so much for having me here today. <laughs> this is where I miss having a live audience, Taifa. Thank you so much for uh, that wonderful and inspiring but realistic take on what's happening right now. Um, my name is Laura Ross and I'm the communications director here at the League. Uh, again, I just want to thank Taifa and, and everyone who's a part of this forum today. It's, it's a really special event. Um, and I do wanna remind folks, we're getting some questions in, and I wanna remind folks that they can ask questions either by emailing info at mlpp.org or texting ask MLPP to 63566. If you're not quite sure how to do that text ask, uh, there are directions in the agenda if folks wanna pull that up. Um, Taifa, I'm gonna get started if I may with our first question, uh, and that is what hope can we have for bipartisanship right now? So really starting out with a really easy, simple question. As you know, <laughs> the League is a nonpartisan organization. So certainly a question we've been asking ourselves too. That is a great question and not an easy one. Um, I think the, the polarized politic that we are living in today is something I've not seen in my lifetime and you know I'm half a century, <laughs> a little over half a century at this point. Um, and so I think we are up against some tremendous cultural, um, political, uh, ideological challenges, right? Um, and we've talked about equity in a way that is leading from our heart and a values proposition that if we all have equitable opportunity, we say that that should be it, but there isn't equitable opportunity, um, or as some might say, equal opportunity. And so to break through this partisanship and this hyper-political moment, all I can say is 
what I've learned in terms of doing this public policy work for 25 years is it's about relationship building, right? It's necessary to build relationships, not just with like community and grassroots groups. So it keeps us grounded to people's real lived experience. Um, but also as I've worked in Georgia for, for many, many years, you know, once I got to work with folks on both sides of the aisle, you connect on this human level. And so you kind of strip away the politic, right? And then really see people for who they are and what they believe. And I, I've worked with lawmakers, particularly, um, you know, Republican and Democratic, who once we got to talking about the real issues and our cares for, you know, strengthening the state or the country, there was a lot of commonality, right, and synergy, but the politics then play out in a way that sometimes just is a barrier. So I would just encourage us to continue to build relationships with these decision makers and policy makers uh, on a human level to see folks, right, uh, and then also speak from our values. I know Michigan League and Demos and other organizations try to make the economic case for a lot of the issues we care about, you know, why investing in poor communities and job training and education is the way that really helps strengthen our, our economy writ large. Uh, but I also think there is, you know, the narrative work that has to be done to really dispel some of the myths um, and the, the disinformation and the misinformation that is out there that many of our decision makers have embraced. So I think it's speaking the truth right, to power uh, for a lot of our lawmakers, holding them accountable. So I think there's this, you know, relationship piece, but there's an accountability piece as well. Um, and the more that we can do that to both sides of the aisle, um, I would hope that that would lend itself to more bipartisanship, um, or at least that we're seeing each other and not fighting cross purposes. Thanks. Yeah. And then the next question we got, uh, this is from Mari or Marie, not quite sure, it came through email, um, somewhat related to this, but uh, essentially, uh, they say, as you likely know, House Bill 5097 passed the House last year. This may not be something Taifa knows, uh, but essentially the question is, I believe that the state limiting the free speech of our teachers and their capacity to teach about institutionalized racism is something that we cannot allow. Um, all of the issues advocated for and addressed here today are perpetuated unless the dialogue is changed at the K-12 level. So what they're asking is, what, what do you or what does Demos advise um, beyond writing to our legislators as a way to combat this effort uh, to control and limit education of K-12 students when it comes to racial and social inequities? And I will say, Mari, thank you for this question. Uh, I'm a former teacher myself, so this is certainly something I've had my eye on. I'm curious, Taifa, what you or what Demos is is saying about this issue. Yeah, thank you for that question, Mari. I, we we can't be silent. Um, I think often we've talked about, particularly those of us who care about equity and justice, uh, economic justice, racial justice, is that we've seeded the ground for this narrative uh, to the very. Uh, my minor minority voices uh, of conservatives or on the right who are trying to, what I would say is undermine our ability to advocate for the issues that we care about. We've all talked about the reason why we see such inequities of outcomes across education, health, wealth, um, and income is because of systemic racism. It's been those choices that have been made uh, in policy for dozens, decades, hundreds of years, right, that has, uh, as this book uh, from when Affirmative Action was white, shows us that, that the, policy, the policies that were written, as I said earlier, the value proposition was supported those uh, who didn't have melanated skin, right? <laughs> um, and so how do we um, now speak the truth to power and create other mechanisms to educate our broader electorate about these issues and its impact. Um, I think, again, we have to take this head on at Demos. We are actually starting to look at some analyses of where these anti-democratic, at the end of the day, these are anti-democratic policies um, that are being passed across the states to limit freedom of speech, to change what teachers and administrators can do in our schoolhouses. Um, and it is to undermine our ability to call out uh, the systemic racism that we see. So I would say continue to educate 
your public, um, create the, we, we've been talking about political education campaigns. We've been talking about doing narrative work to really combat this cross-sectorally. I've talked to faith leaders about this, you know, racial justice organizations, uh, policy think tanks, and how do we talk about this sort of uh, anti-CRT environment? Uh, because again, it is a, it's a tool, it's a communications tool and strategy to undermine our um, elevation of systemic racism. And if they remove that tool from our tool uh, belt, if you will, um, it will cripple us. Um, and that's, again, I think done on purpose. So I, I would just encourage you all to continue to collaborate across sectors. There's a lot of common messages and this particularly for our young people um, who need to know history. Um, you know, what are the ways that we can continue to document? Uh, one of the projects we did in Georgia before I came to Demos was to document all of the racist history uh, in the state, all the policies that excluded women, that excluded people of color. And once you lay out that history of policy decisions historically in your state, there was no question that there was an advantage or disadvantage, right, for, for people of color, for low wealth folks, um, for ancestor, you know, descendants of, of slaves. So I think that we just have to continue to document and speak the truth. Um, and my hope is that as we collectively continue to push back on this narrative uh, that undermines us, that we'll win. And I, I truly believe uh, the truth will prevail. <laughs> Oh, we don't hear you, Laura. So sorry. Can you hear me now? Okay, thank you. Um, so it's sort of like you're doing these great segues into the next question. Uh, the next question question we got, um, and this is unrelated to the previous one, but but more in general, and it, it may seem simple on the surface, but this is from Lakita, and she asks, how can we raise higher awareness in our local communities? So I think we all sometimes think this is easier said than done. Um, you mentioned a couple of things, but maybe some clear strategies that advocates can use. Yes, I love this question. I just had an opportunity to be with a host of uh, leaders of color, particularly women leaders of color last week in New Orleans. And we just really got to talking about this particular piece, um, especially around uh, some of my uh, colleagues who do organizing and civic engagement work is that, you know, because of political and election cycles and issue campaigns. Uh, this is Suma, who is the president of People's Action, for example. She just has a real passion uh, for addressing this issue head on. But getting back to the roots of community organizing, you know, it is the basis of just knowing folks in the community and it's a convening mechanism, it's a relationship building, it's a knowing, you know, strategy to get to know the real issues. And it's the piece that ties, it's the glue that really helps communities stay together. Um, and I think that's where the height, heightened awareness can happen. You know, what I've heard from movement folks all over the country and in Georgia is, you know, we've gotten away from that basic just community connection because we've gone to communities just around election cycles to GOTV them and to door knock, but not to actually understand what their real issues are. What are the ideas and the solutions they have? We're not in a posture of listening, right? We're in a posture of extracting and transacting, getting them to the polls as opposed to building that real civic power that is necessary for them to stay engaged, right? For them to continue to show up at the polls because they have a real stake and they understand, you know, what's happening. So I think that is the part that I highly encourage, you know, folks like Michigan League, and I know you all are doing this with Rennell, uh, one of my, you know, just uh, champions that I just admire so much. Um, but yeah, I think that is the answer to that question. We've got to be in relationship and in community with community. Yeah, I think that's great. And it's definitely something we talk about here at the League. I know we have some of our advocacy boot camp participants in the audience. Shout out to them. And of course, to Renelle and her community engagement team doing such a great job. But there is such a difference um, in be between being community driven and community informed. And then on the flip side of just going and pushing into community. So I'm so glad that you, you talked a bit about that. Um, this next question is a little more pointed. This is from Regina. And she asks, 
What are five examples of public policies you would highlight that have contributed to systemic inequities that we see today? So five public policies that I, I yeah, whether historic or currently still in place. Sure. So mm -hmm. the Labor Relations Act of 1935, don't get me to lie in about the date, but I think that's right, <laughs> um, you know, was the first sort of labor act that was passed to support workers. And it excluded uh, agriculture and domestic workers. And if you recall, historically, agriculture workers and domestic workers were predominantly uh, people of color, black, black workers um, who, you know, those were the industries and occupations that they held coming out of slavery. So they were excluded. So they did not have the protections like every other industry and occupation. So that's one. Uh, the GI Bill, um, that was another where we saw there was a disparate uh, impact on uh, black and brown folks using that bill who served but then came back and couldn't get a home because of redlining policies uh, that the government and the bankers cahooted on in terms of drawing these lines to say which communities were mortgageable and could get financing. And that, of course, created the, um, you know, the communities where black and brown folks could not live um, and that puts them into, you know, these poorer under resourced communities. So those are the two um, that at least pop up in the top of my mind right now. I mean, there's a host of other types of, of laws where women, you know, couldn't coke sign on, they couldn't get to have a bank account on their own without their husbands. And so women weren't able to amass wealth or have their own sort of financial uh, support because of, you know, policies that uh, were detrimental or, you know, exclusive of women having their own financial security and economic security. So those are a couple in the top of my mind, but there's there's many. <laughs> and I would say if you want to understand more of those public policies around housing and income, uh, Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law, is a great resource uh, when affirmative action was white. I don't know the author's name, but that is a great resource that documents all of the public policies over the last many decades that favored white people versus people of color. And it really helps give you a foundation of how those policies created the inequities that we see ec economically today. That's great. Yeah, we'll we'll find some information on those resources and drop some links in the chat. Um, I also, I, and I, I just think that takes us back to Mari's question too of, you know, students in our, our country get a lot of, of U.S. history and it's so often leaves out the the negative policies and, and things that, or, or shows just one side of that coin. Um, so we are getting, um, a couple of questions here on the EITC and specifically how the EITC um, would help improve outcomes. And I, as you mentioned, uh, and as our audience probably knows, this is something that the league has been working on with partners, you know, it's um, on with leaders on both sides of the aisle with the business community um, and others. So just wondering if you have any insights into the EITC for our audience. Uh, absolutely. So one of the things that we appreciate or understand about the earned income tax credit is what we have been sort of doing and donning it as a bottom up tax cut. You know, if we understand tax policy um, and how regressive it is, particularly for those at the bottom of the income ladder, you know, these are workers predominantly who are struggling to make ends meet, who uh, don't have some of the other financial supports like health care, um, retirement, you know, all those things that the earned income tax credit is a credit that actually um, would support and reward, you know, these folks who are working and give them some tax relief. Um, and right now, if you couple all of the taxes that people incur, uh, it is regressive. Oftentimes, people at the bottom of the income ladder in the fifth percentile, um, those struggling to get to the middle class, um, pay a lot more uh, in their taxes than those at the very, very top. And so it's a way to support what, with tax relief, uh, these working families who have children who are trying to stretch their dollars. And so we fully support uh, the expansion of EITC, um, it, uh, pr providing additional um, sort of criteria uh, for people to earn it. For example, single uh, uh, individuals as opposed to working families with children. We know that dependents 
uh, care is important. Uh, but I do think that the EITC is a great tool to level the playing field when it comes to, to tax policy. Thanks. That's great. Um, and I think we're, we're running a little low on time, but I would just ask uh, if I could ask one more question of you, you know, what we've got a, a few weeks here until this really critical election. What is your your biggest call to action for the, the folks who are here today? What can they do to make sure democracy wins out? Yeah, I, I am. I am telling everybody to brace themselves. <laughs> you know, if we are students of history um, and understand data and trends, um, it is likely that there would be a shift in this midterm cycle. Right. Um, and I think depending on whether or not there's a political shift in both houses or one house, uh, the, the ground that we will have to advance these policy solutions that we believe will expand equity will be more challenging because of the ideological uh, environment that we're in. And so we're going to have to continue to sort of be bold and fearless, as I said earlier, but also be unapologetic in fighting for these communities. Because again, as I think about as the president of Demos and Demos being the people, how am I showing up for the people when we do see the outsized power that corporations and these politicians who sit in these seats and control so much of the wealth and the decision-making and, and the appropriations that affect our lives each and every day. How are we making sure that the people can be at the table, that they can agitate, that they can do all the things to really change these structures um, and structures of politics, structures of appropriations, uh, instead of dollars being, you know, doled out behind the closed door of people need to be able to see and make more transparent um, the government that should be serving and supporting the people. So those are the things that I don't care what happens November 8th. I'm going to show up for the people, particularly black and brown folks who have been most excluded, who need the most attention, who need targeted uh, investments and ideas and solutions. And if we can ensure that those who've been excluded can be included, that to me is the inclusive democracy and economy that I dream about every day. So I just say stay encouraged and keep keep up the fight. And if there's anything that I or Demos can do to support Michigan League or your partners, please don't hesitate to give us a call. That's great. Yeah, I, I think, and one of the biggest things in this next few weeks too, is just making sure that we prevent voter suppression as much as possible. Absolutely. Um, we know Promote the Vote is on the ballot here in Michigan, definitely supporting that. And I think even today, I just was scrolling through Twitter and saw that down in Georgia, um, there were a couple of voting sites that were supposed to be open for early voting, you know, um, no one was there. So just making sure to educate uh, communities as much as we can and get the word out. Um, we'll put some links in the chat too about just how to, to promote voting in general uh, and get people out. But Taifa, I am just so honored that you were able to be here with us today. Uh, again, I will applaud. I know there are <laughs> hundreds of people out there applauding right now, um, just thank you so much. in their own living rooms or offices. So thank you again, please stay in touch and um, at this point, we're going to take a thank quick you. little break. Yes, thank you, Taifa. Uh, we will be back in about five minutes with our panel, which will address Michigan's affordable housing crisis. And, you know, as Taifa knows and, and mentioned too, um, you know, housing is such a, a foundation for everything when it when it comes to economic justice. And, and uh, so we're eager to learn from them. But thanks again, Taifa. Thank you. Um, we hope to see you soon. Time. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
Welcome back. As we talk about a future for Michigan that is equitable and vibrant, it's important to examine the foundation of our lives, our homes. Michigan has been faced with an affordable housing crisis for years, and until we are able to emerge from this crisis, we cannot expect to thrive as a state. Today, our panel will explore the critical role that housing plays in our lives, and we're very fortunate to have Alicia Mazzara here, here to moderate our panel. Alicia is the Deputy Director for Housing Equity and Data Analysis at the National Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. Her team works to protect and expand access to affordable housing for people with low incomes. Alicia evaluates the degree to which federal rental assistance program assist underserved populations, particularly people of color, and to what extent people receiving rental assistance are segregated into communities that have historically experienced underinvestment. Thank you for being here today, Alicia, and for moderating our panel. Thank you, Karen, for that introduction and for having me here today. Um, so we're going to talk about affordable housing in Michigan today, and I am joined by three experts who work every day to make Michigan communities stronger. I'm joined by Rock on Terry, who is a mom and an advocate who works on issues related to homelessness, domestic violence, mental health, and child abuse. She sees advocacy as a way to pay back with personal elbow grease for all the support she's received to gain stable housing after struggling with homelessness. Uh, we're also joined by Jim Shafsma, who's a housing attorney with the Michigan Poverty Law Program, where he works on a range of different housing issues, including federally subsidized housing programs. Uh, and finally, Ruth Johnson, the Public Policy Director at Community Development Associates of Detroit, will be joining us. She is also a teacher at Wayne State University Law School, where she focuses on accessible and affordable housing. So welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time today to talk to us. Um, I've given you all very brief introductions, but I would love to go around and have each of you maybe take two minutes to tell us a little bit more about your work and what you do. And also we just had that great keynote. So if there's anything like on your mind, any reactions you have to that, I welcome that as well. Um, so we'll start with Terry and then we'll go to Jim and then Ruth and we'll kind of repeat that cycle throughout all the questions. Um, so Terry, why don't you kick us off? My name is Terry and I am basically in the Southeast Michigan area. I'm going to say the theme of the event being just in time, I feel like my nephew has his ears ringing somewhere because he's always saying that that's him, just in time or just in case, whichever one. But uh, I was asked why I was still being an advocate sitting as a survivor on the COC, which is the continuum of care in my county and after so many years. And I told her, I said, that it was basically because nothing's changed. Nothing's changed, it's still the same. You still have to do agency time and so on and so forth. So I'm going to stay an advocate and be an advocate and still be rock on about the whole thing. So thank you. Thanks, Terry. Jim, do you wanna go next? Yeah, I'll be glad to. Uh, thanks, Alicia, and thanks for joining us today. Thanks to the League for this invitation. And I look forward to our conversation today. So I'm the housing attorney at the Michigan Poverty Law Program. The Poverty Law Program tries to support the work of legal advocates for Michigan's low-income residents, and we do that. We try to do that in a variety of ways, do a lot of consultation, uh, primarily with legal aid attorneys, but with a number of other constituencies, too. And then we do uh, a lot of direct advocacy, too, legislative advocacy, uh, administrative advocacy. So I do a lot of work with MISHTA, with the governor's office um, over the course of the pandemic with the Michigan Supreme Court. And I'll talk a bit uh, about that work and then, you know, a certain amount of other stuff, trainings and publications work as well. So, you know, glad that we can engage this really uh, critical and pressing issue of improving housing opportunities for low-income families in Michigan. Ruth, you wanna go next? Sure, and thank you for this opportunity. My name is Ruth Johnson and I am not the former Secretary of State, so don't get it twisted. Um, I serve as the Public Policy Director at Community Development Advocates of Detroit, which we affectionately call CDAD. 
Uh, we are a membership oriented, nonprofit, nonpartisan uh, organization based in the city of Detroit. We have over 200 members across the great city of Detroit. Uh, they range from block clubs, neighborhood associations, community development organizations, community development finance institutions, individuals. And what we have in common is they have a place-based nexus with the city of Detroit, although they may have a larger service or target area than the city of Detroit. But we work around affordable and accessible housing, community benefits, uh, land use, uh, community effective community engagement, and much, much more. And I just wanted to reflect on something I heard uh, Taifa say about power. One of my basic principles and premises is that we are born with power. It's not that we have to get power. God gives us power. And babies are some of the most powerful advocates I know because they will advocate for a diaper change or for food very loudly and effectively. But what happens is that sometimes their barriers, uh, whether they're emotional, psychological, legal, political, or just practical barriers for our free uh, exercise use mobilization of that power. Yeah, thank you for that, Ruth. Yeah, that's such an important reminder. Sometimes we are, sometimes we are the our barrier, right? Sometimes there are other things, but it's important to remember that. Um, so today we're going to be talking about strengthening Michigan communities, and I think before we can really get into that, we need to figure out what it is what we mean when we say a strong community. Um, so Terry, to start us off, can you tell us a little bit about? what your vision is of a strong community and in particular um, what do survivors like you need to be able to build community and thrive in a community i would like for you to say thank you for saying that it's surviving and not lived experience because i have yet to get paid for my homelessness as a job so thank you that's an important distinction i think that there needs to be real hope and trust put into the first steps of creating a stronger community. It's hard as someone who has gone through homelessness for over 15 years, just shy of a little over 15 years, that it's, it's hard to have hope because you're not feeling like you're having that trust on the other side of the table for people who are offering services. And then there's also a lot of separation of people who are staying in the shelters and gathering in homeless areas where the population will like hang out under the bridge or have their own little tent city so on and so forth not being able to allow us to have that congregation ability and make it so that we can communicate with one another to meet our own needs. We all know when, as a community, we meet needs. That's how needs are met. That's how meet, uh, needs are addressed also is within community. So if we are able to make it so that consumers who are in that struggle can gather and not be prevented from that gathering, we can build a stronger community in that instead of being labeled as loitering or that you know we're conspiring on how we're going to take over the world or whatever it might be because i have yet to get my crown from the leading the world in that but it is an inevitable thing it is an inevitable thing that we will gather and that we will have gather for strength and in addressing our needs so i think once the needs have been able to be addressed and allowing an open communication for all parties involved, that that trust is in the community. You need to have the trust to have community, which will eventually lead to real hope and not false hopes. I appreciate the question too, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Terry. Yeah, I mean, what is community without people, right? Um, Jim, if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, what strong community means to you and particularly, you know, how does that measure up to the current landscape of affordable housing in Michigan today? Yes. 
So in housing terms, you know, my vision of a strong community and a strong state is one where every household can have safe, decent, and affordable, or at least near affordable housing in a place of their own choosing. And, and sadly, as I um, am confident, uh, most of you know, we don't have that in Michigan uh, because of an increasingly severe lack of affordable housing and a long history of deeply rooted housing segregation by race and income. Um, as the Michigan housing needs summary that the National Low Income Housing Coalition has prepared shows, and so Laura, maybe if you could um, share that screen, uh, the housing market, and let me just quickly add that the NLIHC and Alicia's organization, the Center for Budget and Policy uh, Priorities does a, do, do really exceptional uh, job at compiling data and then presenting it in very clear and understandable and compelling ways. So um, it's really great that Alicia is here with us today. But you know, our, our housing market is broken um, and dysfunctional and the numbers in the housing profile have only gone up. You know, the shortage of rental homes is affordable, especially for extremely low income uh, families, that that has only gone up, that the uh, um, annual household income needed has gone up. And that's in part because of a change in HUD's fair market rent, which is mostly a good thing. And maybe I'll have a chance to talk about that a bit in the future. Um, but this most, I think, troubling uh, statistic is this last one, the 71%, meaning that you know, more than three quarters of households in the lowest income category, extremely low income, pay more than 50% of their income towards rent and utilities. And as probably you know, the standard measure of housing affordability is housing costs, so rent plus utilities that consume 30% or less of a family's income. So that severe cost burden is very difficult, if not impossible to sustain. I, I often hear um, from people, even, even including legislatures, why don't these tenants just pay their rent? Why are they avoiding paying their rent? Well, it's because there's this huge mismatch uh, between income and housing costs. These co cost burdens are so extreme. Um, and these households' financial uh, situation is, is so fragile that um, it, it makes housing stability you know, very difficult to both get and to uh, man maintain. And then the NLIHC also uh, has another study. It's called its Out of Reach Study. Um, and it uses this device called the housing wage um, to you know, demonstrate how unattainable affordable housing can be for low-income families. And again, this is re these are recent numbers, but because of uh, some positive changes in the fair market rent, this number is only higher statewide, and it's much higher uh, in some of the higher uh, housing cost communities in Michigan. Um, so, I mean, what what this what this data demonstrates is, um, in, in a different way, is that severe cost burden that that threatens and afflicts so many families and makes them vulnerable in so many um, ways. And so, you know, what we see in Michigan, and it's not unique to Michigan, but across the the state, uh, across the country, rather, is um, that the supply of what's sometimes called naturally occurring affordable housing, so market. Um, rate housing that is affordable is shrinking, including in rural areas. And, and for a long time, at least in my um, decades now long experience of working as a housing advocate, that in rural areas, um, there was more of this naturally occurring affordable housing. And we're seeing that less and less. And just drawing on Ms. Butler's you know, comment, she talked about um, the oligarchical dynamics of our economy. And that's that's one of the factors I think that affects, and it has for a long time, that this lack of naturally occurring affordable housing is that what we're seeing, it's been around for a long time, but I think it's intensifying, is the presence of what's called private investors, so private equity investors. So, you know, these entities from Wall Street or other, you know, citadels of um, economic power um, that are using that power to make it much more difficult for Michigan and, and families across the U.S. to have affordable housing. And so now one of the few ways that families can get affordable or near affordable housing is through a federal housing assistance program. But the subsidy programs fall far short of meeting demand that fewer than one in four families who are eligible for some type of housing assistance uh, get it. And we're losing more affordable units than new units are being developed. And 
And so we have this huge and growing housing supply problem. And you know, as, as many have been saying, and there's even a book um, on this subject that homelessness and eviction are at their roots, housing problems, housing supply problems. Um, we've had a, and, and I don't know if I'm taking too long here, at least if we want to move on or not, um, was maybe just gonna talk for a minute or two about our, our rental emergency rental assistance program. But if we need to move on, um, that's, that's fine. Why don't we have you talk more about that in the, the next question? I think that will fit in nicely, actually. Okay. Yeah, but thank you. I mean, the like you said, the numbers on all of this, it's just eye-popping in Michigan and in so many other places around the country. Um, Ruth, I want to give you a chance to, to also share your vision of a strong community and also tell us a little bit about um, how community members can actually be involved in the decisions that actually shape uh, where they live. Yes. Um, what I really like about this question is that each one of us who are participating in this public policy forum could probably answer this question because each of us have a vision for a strong uh, community. Um, whether you're in a geographic community that is considered urban, suburban, rural, whether you are part of a, a community of interest or affiliation around early childhood or public health or uh, housing, uh, but I think what's really important for public policy advocacy purposes is to have a shared vision of a stronger community based upon a group of community stakeholders, advocacy goals or strategies or priorities. And, you know, it could be around a lot of different things, homeowners, home ownership, renters, tenants, landlords. It could be around uh, service providers and making sure services are adequately funded around organizers and organizations. But I would also want to add, and this is my maybe my um, realistic optimism uh, in play. I would like to rephrase that question. Our communities are strong. We'll, we want to swear them to be stronger and more powerful in the exercise of their collective power. So when I, if I may answer what I, my personal professional vision for a stronger community starts with strong, well-resourced individuals and families. That is the building block of a stronger community. And with that, not only are the individual and community basic needs need to be met, but also there needs to be uh, uh, strategies to ensure that all members of the community, regardless where they live or how they choose to live, uh, have safe, accessible and affordable, truly affordable housing, utilities, uh, transportation, food, safe water, safe uh, air, all of that. Um, so I'm not saying that if you don't have that, you can't be an effective advocate. What I'm saying is makes it more difficult to really exercise your power. But also we need uh, strong community faith-based organizations, strong businesses, strong uh, leadership. And when I think about community development, I'm not just talking about the physical development, but really the human development is as important or maybe more important. Um, a lot of this, whether we're talking about strong communities or the components of strong or stronger communities, is making sure there are sustainable resources, services, and supports. It shouldn't be the winds of uh, politics, policies, or politicians that, you know, there today, gone tomorrow, or never there. <laughs> or And when we're talking about uh, housing policies, really, we have not had a comprehensive, well-resourced, uh, ongoing, uh, housing policy that meets the needs of Michiganders. Um, but I also think part of a stronger, thriving community is one that respects, values, and engages all community stakeholders, really appreciating their views, their voices, their expertise, their experience, and their wisdom. And I am going to push back uh, what the keynote speaker said, having an equal voice. I don't want an equal voice. I want some voices to be more equal those that are directly impacted by those policies, those voices should have a special place in the public policy making process. So in terms of an example of that, here at CDAD, we're part of many coalitions because we understand group power, collective power. 
and we're proud to be a member of the Detroit Right to Council Coalition. And recently we worked with uh, community members, tenants, landlords, uh, organizers, grassroots organizations, city council members to pass the first Right to Council ordinance in the state of Michigan. But we're just part of a national movement. One of the things we do is, you know, build power with national, state, and local organizations that are doing similar work. Uh, and that's how we formed our coalition. But one of the key things is, is that we ensured that a certain percentage of coalition members, especially in our core group, our steering committee, are tenants. That was intentional, that was purposeful. And not just like, oh yeah, you can come to the meeting, but providing the support they need. So when we had a call to action uh, uh, to come down to city council, we ensured that people had rides or if people were driving, we provide stipends for parking. We assist people, support people, and love people where they are and what they need to be effective, powerful, and strong community stakeholders. Can I add on top of that for just one moment? I love everything that you guys have been saying, and I appreciate it as being the person that's on the other side of the table that needs those things, so thank you. When I was born, 20 years ago, I, I was asked to be on a committee. I thought, as, you know, sitting as a survivor, of course, I thought that I should not be saying anything inside this meeting because these were all the executive directors of programs that were helping me and my children at the time. And when I learned that I could have a voice, and that I should use it, I never stopped. Didn't stop at all, which is part of the reason why rock on became such a big thing, because if I thought it was going right, I would say rock on. And, you know, they thought that it was just me being stuck in the 80s, even though I wasn't born in the 80s. But, <laughs> but that, that having that voice, I knew I was only one of maybe five survivors that was sitting on a COC and that and it's still disturbing because I still feel like my voice had doesn't have enough strength or backing behind it because it's just me half the time going to meetings or going into you know into legislation stuff and so on and so forth it's hard and it's important yes I think that as a survivor my voice should be stronger than the executive directors that are coming around and making decisions for me and for my family and for my friends and everybody else. I feel that our voices are very important. We need to start having more survivors coming into committees and being able to share our stories so that we can understand where the downfalls are and what's working really good and keep that one up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Um, I don't know, Ruth or Jim, if you wanna add on to that or I can keep us going, but I wanna make an opening for that. I would say ditto what Rock on Terry said, but I would expand you have to be intentional and strategic, meaning some um, right to counsel uh, community coalitions in other cities, they had a separate lawyers group and a community group. We, we purposely decided to keep everyone together, but we also understood people had different access to knowledge and information and experience. So we spent the time to make sure those who wanted to could understand how the legislative process works for the right to counsel coalition on the city level how to prepare public comment, but it also went to making key strategic decisions were made. So it's not just come in mm -hmm. and, you know, turn on the mic and tell your story. That is important, but we regularly do about every six months a retreat where we, you know, bring people together, but we also go into the community. We don't ask community members always to come to a 2 p.m. or a 4 p.m. Zoom meeting when they're at work or taking care of family members or just living their lives, we go to where they are. We have street teams. We have people who go to the laundromat, the hairdresser, the barber shop, and we'll talk right to council anywhere, anytime in a way that people can receive it. 
and we use all the uh, creative arts, you know, music, puppetry, and lots of other ways to communicate and engage. Yeah, and I would just quickly add that I agree, you know, that it's essential that um, the people are most affected by policy and potential policy changes be involved in the advocacy. And, you know, I can say, and I've been too often a part of it, that that's too often not the case, that those voices, you know, aren't included and it can be too easy to overlook them and, and from uh, advocates, including myself, thinking that, well, uh, maybe some of these people don't understand the full complexity of these issues. And, and I think that I probably know what's best for them. And that's a really dangerous um, attitude and approach to take. And I've, I've seen the, the detriments of that approach. So, you know, I think, especially for people uh, like me, white guys, um, that, you know, we need to be a lot more, more attentive uh, and a lot more, you know, willing to share that power or some of that hope for um, power. So, um, you know, I'm, I, I stand convicted of that and I'm a work in progress on, on that um, score. And um, there, there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Yeah, thank you both. I think, I think we're all a work in progress for sure. But, um, but yeah, I think that's at the core, right? Is who is most affected? They should have the most say. Um, so thank you for for raising that. Um, and speaking of most affected, I'm wondering, Tara, if you can tell us a little bit more about what you're seeing and hearing in your advocacy work around the state with housing in Michigan. I I have seen more than my fair share of the struggles being the agency time complaints and the availability of housing stock, which I, you know, I realize that's not something that can be controlled by policy by having housing stock available, but there really isn't choice for a housing choice voucher. And it's hard. It's I'm, I'm seeing a lot of people actually struggling with that and trying to get their housing voucher to actually be utilized and to obtain housing from that. It seems that it, a lot of it just falls through the cracks on that. And I will say that when I was working as an overnight chaperone at the at a shelter here in my county that I got yelled at by by one of the one of the guests that was staying there who was like, you have no idea how much time I spent at the Hara the Hara's office only to find out that I was supposed to go to Salvation Army instead, you know, and I wasted three hours. Terry, you have no idea what it's like to, you know, I waste, I could have just gone to Salvation Army and sat in their lobby that whole time to get what I needed and blah, 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 you know, and it was four hours, you know, three hours, Terry, three hours. And I'm like, eh. I, I eventually got to the point where I had to put my hand up and go stop. And I was like, one, you're lucky that you didn't have kids with you. Two, yeah, I know exactly what it's like. And you're forgetting that. And three, I understand. I I can completely sympathize with that struggle and, and that it is ridiculous. You shouldn't have been sitting at the Hara. You should have been directed before you got to the Hara to go to the Salvation Army. And I'm not sure how that confusion happened. But... You know, I told him, I said, you know, imagine having to pack the hand busies. I had to pack hand busies to go to the agent, to the Haras, and then to DHHS, and then to Salvation Army, and then to, so that my kids had something to do with their hands. Because if you didn't have the hand busies, I had a ADHD child that would go underneath all the chairs and crawl through them and irritate everybody that was sitting in those chairs, you know, and then I'd get complaints about it. So I'd like for there to be a way for agency time to be reduced. I'd also really appreciate it if there was a little bit more trust in revealing the full programs because just telling me, hey, you've, you've been put on the homeless preference wait list, but you're not telling me what it is. What does that do for me? 
hey, we pulled your name and here's your, you know, you're going to get an HCV. Oh, okay. That's great. What, what is that? What, how can you explain it? I ended up when I was in the shelter the last time, which was six months ago, almost to the day, exactly six months ago, I was educating the staff and the guests, the consumers that were around me on the programs because I knew about them only because I sat on a committee. So I feel that, you know, educate the consumer, let them know what the whole program is, let them know what other programs are too, because you would be surprised. I know exactly what Sue needs. I also know exactly what Kelly needs. I know exactly what, you know, and I'm just throwing names out there, John and James and Joe. I know what their needs are. I know, oh my gosh, you'd qualify for this program. You would qualify for this program. Call this place. It's not fair to have that information with help. And that's going to create a lack of trust. Lack of trust brings on a lot of, of there's no hope in it. So I prefer that there would be education about all the other programs and taken and taken seriously. I would prefer to not be in an agency sitting in a waiting room for three hours, finding out I needed to just go to a different agency. And I'd like choice in my housing. I would love choice in my housing. Again, realize that it's not going to be a policy that's going to improve it. But I do feel that, that that's something that not only am I complaining about it, but I know others are. I also know that that HCV, when they read it out loud to you, your landlord packet, they don't tell you about, they expect you to read all 45 or 48 pages of your HCV voucher pa landlord packet. And they don't tell you that the number that's on the front, the awarded amount for a one bedroom is actually has deductions that's on this other page in the packet that you don't. So you're busy looking for a, for a 1125 rent when in actuality, you should be looking for a rent that's 850, you know, because you, they didn't tell you about that page. So I feel that that's something that would benefit a lot of people. I think it would, it would create a better solution and better outcomes. Yeah, thank you, Terry. I think it really goes back to, you know, what we've been talking about before, which is how do you make it possible for people to effectively advocate for themselves? Well, people need information, right? Um, I actually think this is a really good segue, though, into um, my question for Jim, which is to have Jim, you talk a little bit more about the programs that are out there, such as vouchers, emergency, EHVs, um, source of income protections, and kind of, you know, they help, but obviously they don't, you know, do everything as Terry has detailed. There are obviously a lot of um, bumps in the road to using them as well. And so how, how do we, how do we achieve both affordability and choice for people? Yes. Um, some big challenges there. And I really appreciate and agree with uh, Terry's point. I'm going to push back on one. Um, it, that she said about our limited ability to affect policies about housing supply. I think there is um, some to be done and certainly more to be done. And um, very, I think, tragically, Michigan, and sorry to, to, to just um, focus on this for a minute, Alicia, then I'll respond to your question. But if I could just take a minute or two to say, or to let people know, if you don't know already, that Michigan doesn't allocate any of its state general fund dollars to low-income housing development or preservation or even rental assistance, except for some bond financing. All the money uh, the state gets for low-income housing development and rental assistance comes from the federal government. Mm -hmm. And you know, earlier this year, or really part of last year, the state got $6.5 billion in federal COVID relief, ARPA, American Rescue Plan Act, state fiscal recovery funds. And uh, these funds offered a a really remarkable one-time opportunity for Michigan to make a significant investment in low-income affordable housing. $50 million was appropriated to low-income affordable housing. It's a lot of money. 
um, but it's less than 1% of that ARPA state recovery fund total. And housing advocates, it's uh, much more. There's also 50 million for so-called missing middle program for more moderate income uh, families and $50 million for residential clean energy programs. But, and now we have another opportunity and that's because it's expected that after it returns, um, to work after the elections that the state legislature will pass a final supplemental appropriations uh, bill. So there's another opportunity to push for some additional money for um, affordable housing development and possibly rental assistance and emergency rental assistance, which um, is going to be a really grave issue because the almost a billion dollars in money uh, that the state had under its CIRA, its COVID emergency rental assistance uh, funding from the federal government is running out. The portal closed last week. And so um, there's real fear there that without that money, um, evictions will increase. Um, but you know, there's hope for ways to uh, diminish that threat. Our state Supreme Court, I'll add, has been really helpful in adopting some measures that worked in concert with the CIRA program and that um, made the eviction case process more manageable for tenants, including requiring a pretrial hearing in cases and also providing a so-called stay, a delay in the case, in cases um, where a tenant has applied for emergency rental assistance. And the Supreme Court has proposed to make some of those uh, more pandemic oriented changes permanent. So there's an opportunity there. And maybe I'll mention that in a little bit about how people um, can submit comments to the Michigan Supreme Court. So yes, and Terry talked about it, this housing choice voucher program, which is the, the country's and Michigan's second largest uh, low income rental housing program. So there are more than 60,000 uh, vouchers in Michigan, not enough. Michigan administers about half of those. Um, but this program has some really great untapped potential to improve uh, housing and housing choice prospects of its tenant participants that um, I'm going to talk a bit about, or maybe to use Ms. Butler's uh, language that um, we can reimagine, you know, housing choice and housing opportunities, especially for black and brown women, and especially for those of them with kids. Um, I think it's, I, I don't wanna talk about it too much, but the largest housing assistance program in the state is the low income housing tax credit program. So there are around 85,000 uh, tax credit units in Michigan. And this is the, it, it's important to know about this program, I think, because it's the federal government's primary program for the development and preservation of low income rental housing. And most of that is multifamily housing, but it's not a rent subsidy program. And the tax credits on their own aren't enough to create generally affordable housing, especially for families with lower income. So incomes below 50% of the so-called area median income. Um, and so, uh, you know, what, what we need is a great, a great deal more investment in uh, affordable housing units. And um, the tax credit program is what's known as a project-based assistance program where the assistance is attached to units in a multifamily property. And then when a tenant moves out, the assistant remains uh, that assistance remains behind to benefit the next tenant. So other examples of that are the, the HUD public housing program, um, HUD senior uh, multifamily housing programs, and a few others. And in most of these programs, the rent is based on income. They have so-called income-based rent. So rents are based on 30% of a household's adjusted income. But the, the housing choice voucher program, kind of, it's, it's Terry was saying, is the primary example of a so-called tenant-based rental assistance program. And under these programs, the subsidy goes to a, a tenant who has to find a landlord, and that's a tremendous challenge, as, as Terry spoke to, who's willing and able um, to uh, participate in the program and has a unit that um, is financially feasible, feasible for the tenant, given the limits of the, the voucher's value. And so... The waiting list issues are huge with this program. Um, and when a, when a tenant finally gets, or a prospective tenant finally gets a voucher, it's a, it's a huge challenge. I'm kind of repeating what Terry um, said, to find an affordable and decent unit. And, and that, that challenge is only getting more severe for some of the, because of some of the issues we've already talked about. And the value of a voucher, its so-called payment standard, is based on an area's HUD fair market rent. And because that fair market rent is below an average rent, um, most tenants have to pay more than 30% of their adjusted income um, 
towards their rent. So they have to make up the difference between the actual lease rent and what they get in the form of a subsidy uh, payment. And so mo many, probably most voucher tenants don't even have affordable housing. So it's really good that HUD uh, for this fiscal year, fiscal year 2023, which began um, earlier this month, has um, redone the formula for determining these fair market rents. And so the fair market rents have increased about 10%, really at least 10% and more in some places. So today, a voucher is worth um, at least 10% more than it was um, last month. So that's really going to help in terms of um, housing search and the prospects for success for voucher holders. But besides the limited value of a voucher, there are a lot of other obstacles that families face to renting up with uh, their vouchers. Um, and especially um, on their ability to use their vouchers to um, rent a unit in an area of their choice, including so-called high opportunity areas. And these are areas that are marked by uh, low poverty rates with access to good jobs and high performing schools. Another major obstacle, and I think Terry touched on this a bit, is landlord resistance to accepting vouchers. And that's oftentimes because of a lot of myths and stigma about vouchers, like, oh, voucher holders are, are too risky and they're not responsible. And that's so often untrue. And many landlords um, say they avoid or don't want to participate in the program because they don't want to have to deal with what they see as the government red tape, despite getting a guaranteed monthly um, subsidy payment. And then also landlords use uh, so-called minimum monthly income requirements. So they're not counting the monetary value of the voucher as income as a way to further deny housing to uh, voucher holders. And then uh, another big impediment to uh, voucher holder success is that they don't, and, and Terry has talked about this, don't always have the tools they need to successfully navigate this very difficult housing market. But there are ways to deal with these obstacles. Um, and so about landlord resistance and refusal to participate in the program, uh, there's a stick of sorts and Alicia uh, referred to it and then um, some carrots as well. And so our state house, our, our state fair housing law could be amended to prohibit discrimination based on so-called source of income, SOI. And that would include the value of a voucher, meaning that landlords would have to count a voucher as income for purposes of their minimum income requirements, and it would be a lot harder for them to just categorically refuse to participate in the voucher program. Mm -hmm. And there are bills pending in the state legislature that would make this change. There's a coalition of people and organizations working to get movement on these bills. Um, many cities in Michigan already have source of income protections, as do many states in the U.S., and we can do it here. Um, well, the, the carrots for landlords are incentives to participate in the program, such as an additional payment for entering into a voucher uh, tenancy, kind of like a signing bonus. Um, another is a damages reimbursement fund for landlords to tap into. And these are common features of what are known as housing mobility programs. And they've been successful in many places around the US. MISH has adopted some of these incentives for its voucher program. But again, another necessary feature of these mobility programs is resources for tenants, including assistance in education about getting and keeping housing with a voucher. And then finally, another mandatory feature of a commitment to improving the Housing Choice Voucher Program's success and to creating genuine housing choice for tenants in the program is what are called small area FMRs, fair market rents, S-A-F-M-Rs. And so standard fair market rents are determined at the metropolitan or county level, despite the rents within those areas varying significantly. Um, and as their name suggests, these small area FMRs reflect units within smaller areas in these larger areas, and it's zip code areas that are used. And just as a, I think a really pretty compelling example, um, in the Detroit metropolitan uh, statistical area, which covers the five counties around Detroit, the standard FMR for a two bedroom unit is $1,213. And that's very helpfully up from the 1,063 it was last month. But in some low poverty, high opportunity areas in the Detroit metropolitan statistical area, 
the SAFMR is $1,820. So that means that a voucher used in one of those small areas, if the housing agency adopted these SAFMRs, would be worth more than $600 than the one based on the standard FMR. So that's a 50% plus increase. And so using SAFMRs along with these other tools, source of income, uh, discrimination, prohibitions, and housing mobility programs would substantially lift the possibility of voucher holders renting in their neighborhoods of choice, including high opportunity uh, areas. And so really policymakers in Michigan at all levels um, need to seriously uh, consider the choice possibility and potential of this voucher program, um, that there are ways to improve the program and, and make it better for the families participating in the program. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, I think that's so important. Sometimes people are like, well, it's not working. Let's just let's just start over, right? Let's throw it all away. And and right, there are very much we do know how to make things better, but it's it's often in the in the implementation, right? And in the details of this. Um, which I think is what I would like Ruth for you to talk a little bit more about, right? Is is Jim has outlined all these different policies that can help solve some of the challenges that Terry lifted up, but you know, how do we actually implement a lot of these uh, policies that treat people with, with dignity and respect and give them the information they need so they can advocate for themselves and include their input because they're the people most affected by these decisions? Well, I want to talk about implementation of public policies or changes in public policy, looking both upstream and downstream. So going back to what Terry said about program design, service delivery, forms, agency time. Those are opportunities for community stakeholders to advocate for changes. Those are policy changes too, that if we don't value community members' time and expertise, you have what you know Terry explained and described she's experienced and other people have experienced. And that was even true with the uh, COVID-19 emergency rental assistance. It got better as it, as it went on. Uh, federal guidelines, U.S. Treasury guidelines changed, but the forms and uploading documents, and it, these are people in crisis. Uh, but even, be, well, the crisis has been around for 20, 30, 40 years, so it's not like an emergency. The situation was not an emergency, the pandemic exacerbated the existing housing crisis in Detroit. But I would say, again, it's about education, engagement, funding. And part of funding is funding those who are involved in providing the grassroots supports and services, those organizations, uh, whether they're faith-based or community-based. Because I found that for emergency rental assistance, people found out from their pastor, their priest, their imam, uh, their neighbor, their barber, and we don't think of those people should be compensated, but I do. I think it's monitoring and reporting. But going back into the what I call the natural information network, how information is shared is very different on the neighborhood or grassroots level. There are people who are natural ambassadors or navigators or organizations who do that. We need to support and provide resources for the people who are really doing the helping who are actually conveying the information, who are actually assisting people at their point of need. And I think sometimes uh, when we think about public policy implementation, we don't always think about the full breadth of what is needed. It's not just, and it is sometimes a fight to pass something, but it's also a fight, and that's true even with the Detroit Right to Council Ordinance, to get it funded and implemented. Uh, but also it's, they're going to create an office of eviction prevention. Community stakeholders should be involved with how that office is set up because it could be so critical to the success of the ordinance. I could say more, but I'll leave it there. Yeah, thank you, Ruth. And thank you for really giving us that expansive view. I think that's so important because I, I think oftentimes for folks who work on the more legislative side like me, we're like, okay, we did it but we didn't do it right because all the success is, is compounding on itself in all these different ways that things get passed and actually reach people and how people experience the programs on the ground. Um, so I've heard that we have lots of questions for 
all of you on this panel. Um, so I'm actually going to flip it over to Laura to see how many we can get through in our remaining time. Hey, thanks, Alicia. And thanks to our panelists who, I mean, I don't know if you're able to see the comments from our audience, but people are really appreciative of, of your time today and your expertise and your wisdom. So thanks again for being part of this. Uh, I am going to start with some questions. Um, some of these came in via text, uh, but I would encourage folks to continue, if you do have questions, uh, to continue to uh, email us. Uh, this first question is what local policies such as zoning, ordinances, taxes, disincentivize the creation of affordable housing? So what, what sorts of uh, policies are being put in place that are making it harder to create affordable housing? And, and I'll leave it up to you. And, and as I told Alicia, she too is an expert and, and uh, is well steeped in this field. So, you know, Alicia, feel free to respond to if, if you care to. I do know that in my county, and I'm so sorry, I just want to take two seconds. I know in my county, they're making it so that you can't get new property without having it be at least two acres and that you need to build a 2,500 square foot house on those two acres and nothing else. So I'm just putting that out there. That's definitely making it so affordable housing doesn't happen in just the county I'm living in. I would uh, add about, first, we need to understand what is truly affordable housing. And I think Jim talked about fair market rent, but I also wanna talk about average median income, which is the same or similar principle. So HUD, uh, uh, US Department of Health and Urban uh, Development looks at the metropolitan statistical area. So for Detroit, it is a five county radius uh, area, I should say. And uh, what many in Detroit are looking for is a Detroit average median income. Because if you look at the area that covers everything from Warren to Dearborn to Livonia, it's about $64,000, $65,000 for uh, a certain size household, but if you look in the city of Detroit, we're not even saying on a census track level, it's it's probably half that, about 30, 28 to 30,000. So when we talk about affordability, it isn't affordable if we're using the Metropolitan Statistical Area AMI rather than a Detroit AMI. So mm -hmm. I think that is one thing. I'm very proud to say that the Detroit City Council adopted a non-binding, non-enforceable resolution to use a Detroit AMI, at least to the extent where there are local funds. We know if it's a federal state, they're still gonna use the metropolitan. But with that, we can also um, incentivize both uh, for naturally occurring uh, as well as regulated quote unquote affordable housing to serve the low and extremely low. So, uh, you know, 50% of the current AMI, 30% of the AMI. And, you know, in Detroit, we need all kinds of housing. But when we talk about public investments, we should incentivize, prioritize the creation of truly affordable housing for those who most need it. Yeah, I could go on for a long time talking about um, this one. You know, one example is just the whole concept of, um, single family zoning. Um, and so policies that are resistant to the development of multifamily housing in communities. And if you just look at the siting of um, federally assisted multifamily housing de developments, you see that they are concentrated in low income areas. And there's some benefit to that, that they can be a way to um, improve those neighborhoods, contribute to economic development in those neighborhoods, but they really diminish, if not almost eliminate the choice of families to relocate to those high opportunity areas. I talked about the low income housing tax credit program. Mm -hmm. If you see a chart of where they are located, it's in those neighborhoods. Very few of them are located in high opportunity high opportunity neighborhoods. And just the design of the program works against that, that it doesn't create the incentives for developers, the bonuses, so-called, it's a competitive 
um, process. So they're not getting points for, and they should get a lot of points bonuses for locating in other areas. And so we just have this really distorted um, sighting of where our affordable housing is. It's concentrated in low income uh, areas. So we just need to have a more balanced housing policy where, where, when it comes to where multifamily housing properties are located. If I may just add, although the question talks about local policies, uh, just based upon what Jim said regarding LIHTC, low income tax uh, housing tax credit, uh, the MISHTA is actually uh, doing uh, another round of public comment and meetings to get public comment and input on its QAP qualified allocation plan, as well as on a racial uh, impact uh, plan. So I would encourage you to go to CDAM. Uh, or to Mishta and get information because we can right now influence and advocate for changes in LIHTC guidelines and the statewide uh, housing uh, plan that was recently released. So the time is now. Yeah, just if I could really super quickly, you know, on that. So yes, in its QAP for the tax credit program, Mishta recognizes high opportunity areas but a characteristic of them doesn't include there being uh, low poverty areas. And that's an essential you know, characteristic of a high opportunity area that these are low poverty areas. So that's just an example of change that we can advocate for. Thanks. For that's great. Anyone else want to weigh in on this one or did we get cover that? Um, Ruth, I'm glad you brought up, and, and this is another question we got from our audience, uh, you know, how do we define affordable housing? And I think that, you know, being grounded in that understanding is really helpful. Uh, the next question that we got uh, is a little bit technical, so I apologize in advance uh, if, if this is not one that, uh, you no, know, it's not one I could answer, but is the land value tax or split rate tax a solution for encouraging affordable development? And if so, why is it not widely used by Michigan municipalities? I will take a stab at it. Uh, okay, CDAD, thanks. the organization I work for, is interested in providing more community education and engagement on that. Uh, there's currently discussion with amongst uh, Detroit stakeholders and policymakers about, basically it would uh, split the tax rate for the structure versus the land. So what that would do is whatever the value of the land is, is that, but then looking at, so if you want to do a high rise or you want to do the McMansion or whatever, looking at the value of that. But that also ties into some other ways that we can evaluate and incentivize land use and building or preserving uh, housing. That could be community land trust, where again, you separate the land from the housing and use of that housing. Why is that widely used in Michigan municipalities? I think part of it is inertia. There's been a way that people uh, who have been in positions to make decisions see property as a market-driven private interest rather than a community good or a common good that through our various property laws, people have certain rights and responsibilities. So it, I think it's really grounded in um, how we view property, the use of property, and how that benefits or burdens individuals and communities. Thanks, Ruth. Anyone else want to weigh in on this? Okay. Uh, the next question is, um, I'll read you. I can't, I can't put the full question up on the screen. It's a little bit longer, um, but obviously a critical one. Um, so this person says, greetings from downtown Detroit. I moved eight times in 2022 due to low housing and rental stock only to be met with acute predatory and systemic racist practices, despite having a 750 plus credit score, a white male co-signer, a U of M Ann Arbor student with a verified address, um, proof of funds, provided current passport and driver's license photo ID. So the, this is kind of a two-part question. Who can I report my experiences to? 
Um, and also how do I uh, help protect those with less education about the industry and offer solutions to how people can protect themselves from predatory and systemic racism. Uh, and I would also just like to say, uh, if any of you can weigh in on you know, where this is seen, and, and we know it's an issue, we know that source of income protections is, is one way that we can um, alleviate this, but maybe speak to some other policies um, in regards to this. So first, starting with the, the specific question, uh, who can we report this to and how can we advocate for others um, to protect them from this? Um, unless, Jim, you want to say something, I would say in every, almost every county uh, in Michigan, there is a, a legal services organization. Um, in Detroit, we have several, uh, but the ones who focus on housing related things, among other things, is United Community Housing Coalition, Michigan Legal Services, which of course isn't just Detroit, uh, Lakeshore Legal Services, which is Southeast Michigan, uh, you can Google those, you can call them uh, if you can find the number, because it's hard to know in this question what this person has experienced and what they want to report. But it sounds like if they're putting this question up, something happened and, and, it, and it was some, some bad. Uh, so I would say reporting is one thing, getting legal advice and understanding what can be done, uh, both on the individual as well as on a policy level. But it sounds like at the very, if you if someone has moved uh, eight times in a short period of time, they also need housing assistance, which United Community uh, Housing Coalition does and some other organizations. But I would say start with a legal services uh, organization, a nonprofit that could help you understand the legal protections, how to report things. If we also have, um, a fair housing center, a metropolitan Detroit. So if there were instances of discrimination, uh, uh, they can help with that. So there's a variety of service providers, whether legal services or housing uh, locate, relocation help. Uh, but it goes back to the question uh, and, and comments we made before, there's not sufficient um, supply of good, safe, affordable, and accessible housing in Detroit, Metro Detroit, and the state. And I would, I totally agree with Ruth. I would add to that, your elected officials. Um, so in Detroit, you know, your city council representative, your state representative and state senator, uh, I'll, I have to say it's remarkable to me um, how um, many legislators do understand, but how many um, of our elected state legislators do not appreciate or understand the gravity and depth of our affordable housing crisis. That, um, and so they need to, I think they need to hear more about it. So whether you live in a city or a rural location, as I said, it, that the lack of affordable or the affordable housing crisis used to be more acute in our cities, and it still is, but there's no part of the state that is immune to the affordable housing crisis now. And so your elected officials need to hear that of the challenges that it presents to you, to family members, to friends, that this is not an abstraction, that this is a deep reality for too many people. And increasingly, you know, moderate income people are struggling to um, to, to get and keep uh, affordable housing. So, you know, we're, we're just not talking about that's where it's most severe, certainly at the lowest income uh, sectors, but it, it's not confined to them anymore. So they do truly, I think, need to hear more about that. I would like to just say one thing to this person. You rock for using your voice, for complaining, and as an advocate, I've, I've been told by my state senator that I have apparently a, a dossier that, you know, don't tell Terry no is common knowledge in Lansing among all the senators, state senators and state representatives. So just be loud, squeaky. Don't shut up. Keep moving forward. Remember to push it through. Eventually you will get answers. You will. And you're not alone. No, um, in Detroit, there is a tenant association 
and they're tenant organizers. So you are not alone. And uh, if you provide your contact information, I may be able to help connect you to some resources and some fellow advocates. All right, thank you so much. Um, I feel like Jim sort of provided, and so did Terry, a little bit of a segue to this next question, um, which is how do we bridge the gap between policymakers and advocates and people who are not engaged in that work every day? So I think what this person is asking, um, and particularly those who help community members navigate resources and find support. So I, I'm thinking we've got possibly like three different uh, categories of helpers here, lawmakers, advocates, and then, you know, hands-on um, navigators. So uh, Terry, I saw you get excited and I know this is yeah. something you help folks do. So, so why don't you start and we'll see if others have uh, some input as well. So somebody hired me to be a peer at one point, which that's on them. I'm not going to say that it was, you know, a bad thing. It was an extremely good thing. And I know that with every opportunity that I had with each one of the people I was, I was being a peer full amongst that I suggested, do you want to come with me? Did you hear about this? Do you want to know more about that? And eventually at some point that, that fishing reel and your bait does end up getting eaten and you can just reel them in and, and suddenly they, find out that they have a voice and can say something and that it's not to, and that people are not going to be upset that you spoke for yourself. Please don't ever think that people are going to be upset that your opinion is different or that your idea has some precedence and that there's, and that it's going to screw over somebody else or what, excuse my French, but whatever it might be, just speak invite and speak invite speak educate all the time every time anyone would, else on this yeah go ahead i would just add in addition to what terry said a very basic thing is bridge the gap just do whatever you know start with what you know to do and then do it but there may be other people who have different experiences or more experience. Uh, try to uh, locate folks. And part of it is just talking about, I'm looking to bridge the gap between this and this on this subject. And just keep talking to people and people are like, oh, I know somebody, my cousin's best friend's cousin from college works in that area. So part of it is just the speaking, the talking, the communicating, the asking. But I would also add, you don't have to keep hitting your head against a brick wall or just throwing uh, uh, your fishing line into the, the ocean and hope you catch something. To the extent that there are organizations like the Michigan League for Public Policy, as well as throughout the state, that can help you bridge that gap. And some of our policymakers, if you call Rashida to leave about your streetlight, she's going to help you because that's how she's trained her office. Not all policymakers are like that, but many policymakers will help you figure out is that road a city road, a county road, or a state road? You know, sometimes it's not easy to figure out who's the best target and what is the best ask. But my, I would implore you to ask, to talk, to seek, do whatever you need to do with whatever knowledge and opportunities you have. Yeah, and just really quickly, there's some great, I mentioned them early nat national resources, the National Low Income Housing Coalition has a lot of great resources on its website and ways to connect with other tenants to um, make your voice louder and more well informed too about issues, as well as local organizations, you know, a, a lot of them out there could, could spend some time listing them, but. Great. And before uh, I kick it back to Alicia, I just want to add, I know um, Jim and Ruth and others have, have provided some, some great resources. Um, if you emailed me specifically, I'll try to connect you with the right people and uh, we will make sure to get those links in the, the comments. So thanks to all who brought those questions to us. 
Alicia? All right. So we're coming to the end of our panel. Um, so thank you all for like a really energizing, inspiring conversation. Um, so as we close, um, what call to action do you have for our audience? What is one thing that they could do to help um, strengthen Michigan communities and, and help further affordable housing in um, their local communities? I would like to just start out that part of the improving and and everything, you know, like uh, the speaker, the keynote speaker had mentioned how there's always, win, you know, it creates winners and it creates losers. You know, when somebody's coming, getting down and out, just lifting up is the best thing and, and reducing, using your ears, using your ears instead of your mouth to solve the problem really helps so much in, in, in resolving issues. I would say a uh, call to action uh, first is grounded in reminding yourself every single day that you are powerful, you are strong, and you are an effective advocate. And do whatever you need to do to become stronger, more powerful, and more effective. But I'm gonna challenge everybody here with a call to action. Literally call, call a local, state, or federal policymaker today or tomorrow, and just mention your name. If you don't wanna give me your last name, just your first name, and then, something that you are jazzed about that you want them to know that you're jazzed about and want them to work on it. So if you can't think of anything, we've talked about a lot of different issues and I believe Jim will have more specific, but even if you go to the league's website or pick up some of the materials, they have budget priorities, they have policy priorities, but most of us know without being told what we want and why we want it. So I'm challenging each and every one of you Call a policymaker today or tomorrow. You may say their offices will be closed. I don't care. Leave a voicemail. But that is my challenge to you today. So, yeah, sure. I will offer some immediate concrete possibilities. So one thing I mentioned is the possibility of the Michigan legislature uh, enacting some kind of supplemental appropriations bill after they reconvene after the election. So. You know, contact your state legislator, your rep and senator, and, and even the governor's office to urge them to include some money in that supplemental appropriations bill for you know, low income affordable housing development or rental assistance. I mentioned also the Michigan Supreme Court, which has done some great things to uh, manage eviction court cases during the pandemic. It has proposed to make some of those changes permanent by uh, amending the court rule that governs eviction cases. So I think that Laura's maybe gonna drop some links in the chat, but consider commenting and urging the court to you know, make those changes permanent, that they have benefited tenants, that you know, tenants, not surprisingly, I think, as you know, um, in the balance of power, uh, don't have much of that power. So uh, there needs to be a better balancing of it. There are these um, source of income uh, discrimination bills, bills that would prohibit discrimination based on source of income. So urge your state legislatures to uh, support and push for a committee hearing and vote on those bills. Um, and there are a number of other examples of bills out there. One is Senate Bill 949 that the league has been involved in, and that would seal some eviction court case records. So eviction court case records, even in cases where a judgment isn't entered against a tenant, the mere fact that an eviction court case has been filed can be a huge impediment to people securing rental housing. So this bill would uh, provide some protection of another type for tenants. So yeah, reach out to legislatures, let them know that you're concerned about these issues and that you, you know, want to see some action on that. Yeah. On the city of Detroit level, I'd be remiss to not mention, uh, visit the Community Development Advocate of Detroit's uh, website. It is in the process of being redesigned, but you can go to cdad, c-d-a-d hyphen online dot O-R-G. 
You can sign up for our twice a month policy updates, our monthly uh, newsletter. Uh, you can connect to other people who are working towards similar things on the local, state, or federal level. And again, whether you're a tenant, a landlord, a staff of a nonprofit, you work in the faith-based uh, arena, you are powerful. You just may not know how to fully utilize it. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I hope everyone feels a little more empowered and educated and like they can really step into that power to make a difference. Um, and I'm going to turn it back to Karen for the rest of the program. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your time today. Much gratitude. Thank you. Yes, I want to add my thanks to all of the panelists for giving us a strong sense of how Michigan's strength comes from our neighborhoods and our homes. And thank you, Alicia, for moderating our panel. Um, again, I think people are, are, are so appreciative of your time and your experiences and your expertise. Thank you so much. Now, this brings us to the presentation of the League Sharon Parks Award, which is given each year to an organization or an individual who exemplifies the values of former president and CEO Sharon Parks. I am excited to be able to award this year's Sharon Parks Award to Detroit Disability Power. Detroit Disability Power's mission is to leverage and build the organizing and political power of the disability community to ensure the full inclusion of people with disabilities in Metro Detroit. Detroit Disability Power knows that true inclusion is revolutionary. When we evolve our institutions to fully include disabled people, we inevitably build more equitable, accountable, safe, and compassionate communities that are better for everyone. Accepting on behalf of Detroit Disability Power is their dynamic executive director, Dessa Cosma, who is building the political power of the disability community every day through her leadership. Welcome, Dessa. Hi, thank you so much. It's really uh, wonderful to be here with you all. Thank you so much for this award, which I'm happy to accept on behalf of our team and our 271 members. As Karen said, my name is Dessa. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the executive director of Detroit Disability Power. As she mentioned, our mission is all about building the organizing and political power of our disability community. And to do that, we organize uh, disabled people and our allies on a whole host of issues, things like housing, education, health care, and voting rights. And we work to transform the social justice ecosystem to one that has a disability justice analysis and therefore prioritizes the needs of disabled people, especially multiply marginalized disabled people. You can tell by what we do that we'd feel a strong connection with Michigan League for Public Policy and that we'd likely work together. And you'd be right, over the last several years, we've had the good fortune of collaborating on both parts of our mission. League staff eagerly engaged in two anti-ableism workshops that we facilitated, understanding that if we're not intentionally rooting out ableism, we're likely perpetuating it. And we've also been able to work together to increase SNAP access and raise awareness about the critical need for more accessible, affordable housing. Our organizing and disability experience is complemented so well by the League's decades-long commitment and expertise in policy research and advocacy. Thank you so much for being a great partner. And thank you so much for this honor. It feels really good to receive an award like this in recognition of our work but also because we respect and really like working with you all. Thank you again. We really, really appreciate the affirmation of our work.
And thank you so much, Dessa. You've been a wonderful partner in so many ways, and you've highlighted some of the ways we've worked together on policy issues, but also the lunch and learns that you've done for our own staff have, uh, have really been transformational for the league and how we look at um, inclusivity and disabilities. And so we're so very appreciative of you and of your organization and happy to be able to recognize you and your organization today. Thank you so much. So this brings us to the close of our program. Thank you all for attending and participating in today's public policy forum. I think we can all agree that we have some outstanding thought leaders who will continue to drive Michigan toward an equitable future. And we at the League encourage you to join in their advocacy efforts. Please visit our website at www.mlpp.org to learn more about ways to engage in policy change with us. Thank you to all who sponsored today's event, to all of our speakers and to our staff. We will be following up with those of you who registered for today's forum and asking that you complete an evaluation of the program. A link to that evaluation will also be put in the comments section. The League is committed to bringing you to the table to take part in creating a vision for Michigan, and we hope we were successful in doing so today. We encourage you to go out and do good work and to vote on November 8th if you haven't already. Thank you.